When you dare to share, you break the silence. When you dare to share, you speak your truth. When you dare to share, you use the full strength of your voice. When you dare to share, it brings opportunity to own your story. So tell it, be heard, and at the same time, your sharing is someone else's learning, inspiration, motivation, empowerment, and hope. There's always an element to each of our stories that remains a secret. For some, we feel it's a dirty little secret. Dare to Share Your Untold Story exposes these secrets in a welcoming and positive way. I encourage each of you out there to dare yourself to share what is yours to tell. When we dare, it is the courage to do something really important. Let this be a vow to each and every single one of us that we take risk, we brave, confront, and face what is, while inspiring and empowering all communities. So let's break that silence and tap into mental beauty. This is Salima Jadavji, your podcast host, a practicing social worker, and your mental wellness connoisseur. Welcome to the Dare to Share Your Untold Story podcast, episode number 54. She smiles, she empowers, while simultaneously grieving and mourning. To all my fellow listeners, before we get started, I'm just dropping in a note to give you a heads up that this podcast might be emotionally triggering for you. We do invite guests onto the show who share openly about extremely difficult life moments with exposure and impact of what the struggles have been like. The intensity of each episode could have a variable impact on your emotional and mental well-being based on your own personal story. If at any point the topic becomes uncomfortable or upsetting to you in any way, please do not pressure yourself to listen. Instead, be kind to yourself, do some self-care, and perhaps give another episode a try. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our courageous and daring guest, Saidet Abari. A motivational speaker, singer, songwriter, storyteller, entertainer, and children's author, Saidet has cracked the code to connect and engage with youth genuinely. Born to make people smile and impressive in her accomplishments, Saidet's performances inspire, motivate, and empower children. From a desire to make people smile and a wish to build confidence in the younger generation, Saidet's message of encouragement, self-worth, and community-mindedness is also a motivation for a global audience. She presents a powerful message from the heart that one person can make a difference. Together, we can change the world. Saidet was honored with the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2012 and in 2018 was accredited as the first Black Canadian female children's entertainer. She also became the first female ambassador for the National Basketball League of Canada in 2018. Her program, The Saidette Show, was born in 2004 from a desire to make people smile and a wish to build confidence in the younger generation. Saidette has now reached over 800,000 students across Canada. Hello, hello, Saidette. Welcome to the Dare to Share Your Untold Story podcast. Yay! I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> You're so glad. I'm so glad to have you on the show today. And I'm undoubtedly appreciative for your willingness to jump on here and tell your story. Encouragement continues to spark for me, Saidette, when I am met with guests like yourself who actually allow me to draw from their emotional vigor and resilience and inspiration and for just all the stories that are shared in this space. It is so important that we take a stance together to help break barriers of mental stigma. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, well, thank you for creating this space for others to share and to, you know, speak their truth and not only speak their truth, but also continue that journey of healing and also inspiring others. So thank you. Oh, oh that's really, really sweet. Well, that's what this is all about, right? That's just it. This podcast is all about bringing forward those untold stories that people go through. It doesn't have to be about a mental health struggle. I mean, it could be, but what we know, the common denominator is that no matter what a person is going through, there is impact to one's own mental health in some way. And that's the part of a person's story 
that typically remains tucked away. So yeah. that's what, what I'm trying to achieve here, right? It's trying to serve in a way to break those barriers of mental stigma that have been conditioned in our society. So my hopeful mission is that you and I are going to keep standing tall and encouraging people to share and tell yep. what people usually have reservations for expressing. And so I'm also, I guess I continue to bring forward a trend that I'm optimistic will continue its growth. And it's called the mental beauty rethink. So Saidette, what comes to your mind first, as soon as you hear these words, the mental beauty rethink, what sparks for you? Well, you know, we're always talking about what's going on with our bodies, right? Whether we're talking about our beauty regimen or we're talking about aches and pains in our body. But like, if we think about our mind, our mind is such a beautiful thing. And when we begin to see it, as this beautiful organ mm -hmm. that helps us live. And we realize that we need to rethink the way we think about mental health, the way we think mm -hmm. about our minds and how we process things, how we see life, our perspective is all like embedded in that very organ. And, you know, I think it's beautiful to be able to rethink the way we think. I like it. Rethink the way we think. Yes. Yeah. And it's a neat way of looking at this, right? And it's a neat way for you to, you know, preface. Yeah. We talk about body and the physical body and physical beauty and aches and pains, as you say, right? There's always these regimens and these little protocols for health that are trending. Yeah. And when we do have that opportunity to look at our mind as a whole beautiful being, our mind is a beautiful organ, right? That's what you said. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do see, I do see that it shifts the processing. The language that we use really shifts how we process things too. Well, I love that you say mental beauty. We don't really think of it that way. We're always thinking of problems, right? Illness. Right. Yeah. I was trying to capture that where it's not talking about illness or wellness. It's not talking about something being good or bad. Yeah. And I think what I've shared with other guests is like, it's the whole idea of equalizing physical and mental well-being yeah. while neutralizing and normalizing it, right? That it's all one of the same cycle together. You can't have one without the other. I love that. Mm -hmm. But your perspective, it's neat. It's a neat way of looking at it. I'm going to be adding this to the repertoire of mental beauty rethink in the depths of that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Great. Me too. Love, love it. I just, this is one thing I enjoy so much is just picking people's brains about what are their thoughts, what comes up for them when, when they hear these words, because it just fascinates me about how there's so much that we can interpret and so much creativity that we have. So if we focus on neurolinguistics and language and how our perceptions can hold information, there's such a shift that can happen. Mm -hmm. So I get excited every time I, I speak with people about this part. So I'm actually super ready and pumped to unpack this unique story of yours that I have brought you on the show for. So awesome. I hope that you are as ready and pumped as I. Well, I'm bracing myself and I'm ready. <laughs> bracing and ready. I love the combination. I love it. Okay, well then let's go for it. So Saidat, um, Give us the newspaper headline of how you would title your untold story. How would it read? It would read, da -da 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 powerful woman feels weak. Powerful woman feels weak. Loved your drum roll, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I feel like with this headline, this is like, I don't even know if there's something that you feel you can explain or elaborate on without giving away your untold story just yet? Or do we feel, do you feel like it's better for us to dive right in? No, I can you give the teaser for sure. Yeah. All right. I am known as what people call the happiness infuser. I just, mm -hmm. as you can even hear in my voice, there's this mm -hmm. energy about me that just thrives on positivity. And so mm -hmm. wherever I am, I'm bringing this joy. My name, Saidet, means profitable. And my middle name, Titi Lola, means happiness. So I was mm -hmm. literally born to live this way. 
<laughs> and so I was chosen for this gift mm -hmm. of joy and encouragement. And I feel like I've brought that into every aspect of my life, but at the same time, almost covering up or just ignoring the times when I'm feeling weak. Now I do acknowledge it, it like mm -hmm. as a, like, I know, okay, you're not happy or you're, you're upset or you're frustrated, mm -hmm. but I, I feel like I've built my life around being positive that it's almost mm -hmm. a fearful thing for me to share the pain or to share mm -hmm. the grief or things that I feel like, you know what, I life is good, but I feel a little disappointed about this, or I, I feel helpless or hopeless in some aspects of my life. And mm -hmm. because of that happiness that I exude, I feel like I, I don't share that other side. And not that I feel like it's shameful to be that way. I just feel like maybe people won't understand. And mm -hmm. um, I think it even rolls back to um, a time when I decided on social media that I would share that I that things weren't going well for me. And I didn't mm -hmm. get the response I thought. This was like maybe 12 years ago. I shared there was a time in my life where I was just feeling like a really dark side and and I okay. literally received no response. <laughs> and wow. so I think maybe even with that, I just thought, okay, well, that's not what people expect from the side ed show. So let's go back to being the happiness infuser. And so that may be mm. one of the reasons why I don't really share, but I also feel it's because I feel like I'm expected to be happy and mm. positive and hopeful. So that experience kind of shaped your mindset around how am I going to show up for my, for my audience? What are they expecting from me? Yeah. When we're in that place of fear, right? I think sometimes we easily describe things as being scary, mm. but we have to remind ourselves that we're not always in danger. It might just be really uncomfortable or really foreign. And so when something is foreign, it's just not familiar. We just mm. don't, yeah. we're, we're not comfortable in that space. But I think the more that you do it and the more that you engage with it, you get comfortably uncomfortable. You get to that place. Yeah. Yep. And I'm, I'm, I, I can't say I've arrived, but I'm learning to. <laughs> mm. Yes. That's, that's a great step. That's a great place to be in. Yes. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I appreciate the teaser and um, certainly has piqued my interest even more about what we're about to unpack a little further. So, you know, with your permission, yeah, I want to ask you a whole bunch of questions. Ask all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, tell us what your untold story is all about. Can you give us some sort of a synopsis of that? Yes. I have two beautiful children and I know as parents, you know, there are many of us that really long to have that connection with our mm -hmm. children. Uh, we want them to talk to us. We want them to grow and thrive in their communities and stand mm -hmm. out, fit in, level up mm -hmm. academically. Mm -hmm. And I have two beautiful children and, and one child is living the life that she is finding and, and learning more about the world around her with all of her gifts and skills. And then I have another child who is learning about the world in his own way. I have a son who is living with autism. I absolutely love my son. He is now 20 years old. Um, he is nonverbal and what you would call um, autistic on level three. Okay, so level three okay. means there's a, there's a more severe into that spectrum of neurodevelopment delays. And so mm -hmm. for me, for the past 20 years, we have been learning to live with a child with autism, learning to understand him and being able to see those nonverbal cues of how he's feeling about his world, how the world mm -hmm. translates in his eyes and, and being able to navigate that. And I mm -hmm. absolutely honor and cherish the journey 
but I feel that I haven't given myself the opportunity to sit with the pain of Mm. raising and thinking of the future of a child with a disability or exceptionality, learning to understand that there is a, there is a grieving that can happen when Mm. you're thinking of their future. Right. So whenever I have that time in my life where I'm feeling a little hopeless or, or feeling that pain of what if I instantly cover it up with, but there's hope, look what he's doing. And then, you know, let's post on social media, you know, look at Isaiah, Mm -hmm. he's doing just fine. Look at that beautiful smile and not dealing with my own pain. Right. So these opportunities that you talk about to, to sit with the pain, do you feel like these are like external opportunities that are based on your social circle or your social environment? Or where, where do you feel that the opportunity to sit with pain becomes questionable? Where, where do you see that happening? Um, honestly, I feel like it starts internally because I, I, if I really let myself be vulnerable with my circle of people, they would allow me to grieve. There wouldn't be a judgment there. I feel like it's just my own inner grief or guilt, I should say, that makes Mm -hmm. me think, why are you, why do you feel this way? Do you know how many other families are struggling even more Mm -hmm. (laughs) with children, with exceptionalities? I Mm -hmm. feel that maybe it's a bit selfish for me to want something more for him as far as, you know, like I want him to have friends. I want him to be able to live independently. I want him to, you know, give me a break. (laughs) Right. 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 So, you know, you have friends. I think, you know, it's hitting me a bit harder now that he's an adult because you now have friends whose children are in university or they're getting married or they found a job and they're independent. And I'm still celebrating things like, oh, he cooked his own breakfast today, but I'm still there to have to assist him. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, we went for a walk and we were able to go to the basketball game and and sit through the entire game. Yay. It's a different path of parenting, right? Like there's so many nuances and and so many different elements and a different pace. When you're a parent to a child of an exceptionality, there are certain things from what I have learned and heard. And even from what you're saying is that there's a certain pace that's really quick and you're on the go nonstop. And it's a fast, fast pace to keep up with. And then there's these other developmental milestones or other aspects of development that are a different pace that are slower. And so it's really hard to manage and balance those two out because it's so easy to get caught up in these different expectations. And then you're at war with yourself when you have all these thoughts and the thought spirals can be competing with each other. Do you feel like that is kind of what happens to you with your parenting path? Yes, for sure. Because at times you can feel overwhelmed, not only just navigating his world, but your own world. Of mm-hmm. you know, and I mean, we all understand that pressure that comes from social media about, mm-hmm. you know, this person's life is better than yours in a sense. Mm-hmm. And even with uh, families who have children with special needs, there's that competition, not and not that it's intentional, but it becomes mm-hmm. this pressure on a parent to do what some other parent did. And then mm-hmm. maybe you're thinking about it, you're like, I did that <laughs> a few mm-hmm. times mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. Like all I did was give my child this, this, and this, and look, they're talking. Look at my child with autism. They, you know, we put them in intense behavioral therapy, and now they're a scientist. And you know, like things like that. And so there becomes that pressure to be that parent with a a, a mm-hmm. child with exceptionalities. You're the one that they're writing about. You're the you know you're the role model for all of us and. You feel that pressure. 
and then not just pressure to to look good, but you want the best for your child, right? And so you're looking and trying everything there is, and sometimes you're not getting the results that other uh, families are getting, and then the guilt comes in, and then you get the more where you're not trying enough, you're not doing enough, mm-hmm. and it becomes the pressure that many parents experience, but it's on a deeper level because you're you're in a sense you're. You feel like you're fighting for their life, right? Yeah, it's tied in with so many emotions and experiences. It's so vast. And when you talked about feeling guilt, do you ever feel guilty about some of the thoughts that you were having because they're so different? Or do you feel like the guilt comes from the external pressures? I feel that the guilt comes from all sides in a sense. Okay. I, you feel it internally like I didn't do enough. And even to the point where what did I eat? when I was pregnant Mm. with Isaiah, was, is that what Mm. happened? And then you have a lot of medical reports Mm. about different things. They're like, Oh, if I would have known that I would have had more vitamin D or magnesium. And, you know, and, and then you feel like I should have, could have, would have, should have, could have, would have, should have, could have, all the self blaming, should have, could have, would have. You have family members. Sometimes they haven't seen your child for a long time. And then they see them and then they're giving you advice as if you don't know. (laughs) And then Mm -hmm. there's that guilt of, do you not think I'm doing enough? (laughs) I've tried all of these things. How about you take them for a while? (laughs) Right? Right. (laughs) Right. There's guilt from many sides, but I think most of it is internal. Because if you deal with that internal guilt... You can you can withstand all the outside pressure because then it becomes I know who I am I know what I'm doing I, my child mm-hmm. is in the best place that they can be because I was gifted with this child the universe gave me this child for a reason and I'm doing my very best and it doesn't matter what you think <laughs> right? right but if when you when you don't deal with the internal grief and and condemnation I feel like then you're getting that pressure from all sides. Mm -hmm. So when you talked about, you really didn't get a moment to mourn that picture of, you know, raising that child. What was that experience like for you? When Isaiah was about two years old, he had his measles, mumps, and rubella shot. Um, Well, Mm -hmm. that was more like 18 months. And within Mm -hmm. a month, I noticed that something was different. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it seemed like he wasn't aware of his surroundings. Um, A little bit of the speech that he had was gone, and I I just didn't understand what happened. So I thought that he lost his hearing. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I brought him to audiologists, and then they said, nope, his hearing is fine. Maybe he needs speech therapy. So I took him to Type Talk which really, really helps with speech for young children. The speech therapist there was so supportive. And I feel like if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have been able to feel that the strength that I needed to get him diagnosed. She was so patient with me. Her name, her name is Tracy. And she said, Sai Dad, I don't think it's his speech. I really feel like you need to get a diagnosis. This could possibly be something else. And she wasn't pushing it. Like, this is not what you think it is. It's not his speech. It's not his hearing. But I was very much like, no, he was fine. And now all of a sudden he's not. It has to be something else to do with whatever. Was it the vaccine? Was it this? And I didn't realize until later on that the signs of autistic behavior start showing Mm. up around that time. I didn't know that. All I know is there was a big change. All of a sudden, to me, it felt that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she guided me to getting him diagnosed. And the first diagnosis was pretty severe in the way that the doctor presented it. I was devastated because not only was he given a, a diagnosis of autism, but a developmental delay on that severe end. So I was very distraught. That's a lot to take in at one go. Yeah, for sure. My late husband, he didn't take the news very well. We we were also in a type of religion that 
really talked a lot about faith and healing. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of, if you pray enough, if you believe enough, you can be healed of these diseases and, and Mm -hmm. um, illnesses or disorders. And so there was a lot of push and pull with the, we're just going to pray about it. We're just going to believe God Mm -hmm. for his healing instead of like, let's really dive in deep about how to help him. Right. So mm-hmm. there was a little bit of that guilt because of, of my belief, right? Like, oh, there's something I'm doing wrong <laughs> that is creating this problem in my child. So I better pray harder. I better believe harder because, you know, this is why he's the way he is because I haven't believed enough. And there was a lot mm-hmm. of pressure that way. Right. So not only internally, but feeling like I am disappointing God. So yeah. that became something that was, you know, really played a part in in that internal pressure of not wanting to grieve because I had to cover up with prayer. I had to cover it up with, no, this is not something that he's going to have for life. I'm believing God that he's going to be healed. Right. So that I feel like maybe that was where it started. And that would have been a very important part as to why you didn't get to mourn because yeah. you were already busy believing that you've done something wrong. So mourning what was actually happening was not part of the picture. Yeah. But you were having to focus on the belief and the praying and I got to do more. I'm supposed to do more. And do you feel like part of you, and maybe this is too bold for me to ask, but did you feel like part of you might've been shaming yourself at any point? Definitely. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I feel that, you know, sometimes I'm not a, I'm not in that denomination or in a sense religious anymore, but I I am a spiritual person. And even when I think about in Christianity, I don't really feel that it's God that does this. This is the pressure Mm -hmm. that people put on themselves Mm -hmm. to please God in a sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it can translate to anything and you doesn't have to even be religious. You're, you're trying to, you know, raise your family and you're looking around and everyone else that seems to have it together and they have their rules and their things that they do. And then you're like, well, if I only did that, then I will be elevated to this status of perfection. Right. And so I feel like not being religious has actually taught me about that too, because that pressure can come from anywhere. Right. But you have to deal with how you feel inside. Mm -hmm. But you weren't able to because you were preoccupied and really busy trying to figure things out in other ways. And did you do you feel like you ever experienced any other stereotypes or assumptions from the outside world? Oh, I mean, when you think of the intersectionality of things, Mm -hmm. um, being black (laughs) for Isaiah, he's black with autism. There's also that. You know, there's there's stereotypes, you know, that Mm -hmm. you you kind of feel that sometimes black people, there are more kids with autism in certain areas and things like that. And you're dealing with that type of pressure too, trying to prove that I'm educated, I understand, I'm I'm learning all there is to know about autism and always seeming to Mm -hmm. have to prove yourself sometimes. Mm -hmm. As a a Black woman, I, with an autistic child, you know what? I do know what I'm doing. I'm not uneducated. Mm -hmm. So it it feels feels different sometimes. But I mean, apart from that, I feel that Isaiah has really been surrounded by people who loved and love him and support him ever since his diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It started with Tracy. (laughs) And after that... I feel like there was a lot of support for him, but I don't think I leaned on that support for me. Mm, That's the difference. You can say Isaiah in the community of London, and there's a big smile on faces from his Mm. EAs, um, Kathy at, at Thames Valley District School Board, to the church that we had him volunteer at in London called Gateway. There are so many different people that have just really found the joy in Isaiah. There hasn't been many situations where I felt that he was not welcome. 
even the National Basketball League of Canada created a space at the Budweiser Gardens for Isaiah to sit with his family on his own and jump and laugh and and just be able to enjoy getting to sit in a space for long periods of time because at first he wouldn't even sit for one quarter of the game. Right. But because they created that space for him, he was able to learn to sit and to enjoy the game. And now people kind of look over his corner to see how excited he gets when the music gets louder and, and he'll stay for the game. If he starts having a bit of a meltdown, people are very understanding. We've never really faced that kind of pushback or that frustration of like what your child doing, but I have mm-hmm. faced it internally. Yeah. The, yeah. what are people thinking? I have to explain my son to everyone that we, you know, every space that we're in, that they're not familiar with him. It's almost like you had to be overprepared. <laughs> you were on edge, like thinking of all the scenarios in advance and preparing what you were going to say and who you were going to say it to. And just in case someone says this, this is what I'll say back. And I'll make sure I read up on this and know about that so I can respond to all these things. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> so, that's exhausting, my dad. It is. That must have been so exhausting, right? What a toll that it takes on your mental capacity, yes. on your physical capacity, your emotional capacity, and even on your spirit, right? Yeah. That can really exhaust you. It's it sure can. And you know, yeah. always feeling like you have to to defend. Hmm, Big notion of defending yourself. Yeah. But there was a big moment and the life lesson that I learned from my son that really, I feel in a sense, changed how I see life and started that healing journey of letting go of that guilt and letting go of shame. I'm still learning to sit with the grief and sit with the pain but I've learned to let go of some of that. Okay, let me ask you a question, Saiden. When people come to see me in the therapy space, individuals are typically in one of three spaces when they are connecting with me. Some people are getting started where they're like right at the beginning. They know what they want to work on or they know they've got things to work on, but they're not exactly sure where they need to be focusing. Some people are in, in the thick of things. They're right in the middle and... Sometimes it's a storm, sometimes it's a sorting journey, and some people are looking back. And when I say looking back, some people are like looking back, trying to gain closure, or they're trying to gain insight on some things so that they can move forward, or there's that last piece that they're trying to sort out so they can break free to the next chapter of their life. So where do you think, where would you say that you are? Would you say that you're getting started in the middle or looking back? feel like I'm sorting and looking back. Okay. <laughs> I'm still unpacking, yeah. okay. but looking back. <laughs> sorting and unpacking. So you're sort of like in the middle of it, but you're also looking back. So maybe you're kind of... I'm at the tail end of the middle. <laughs> right? Yes. yes, yes, yes. I like it. Okay. Just couldn't pick one, huh? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. And so how do you know when you feel like you're in the mind space of like sorting and unpacking versus when you know you're looking back, what's different in your process? I think the first step for me is being aware that I was not grieving because I just assumed that my position is positivity, hope, Mm -hmm. always looking for Mm -hmm. answers because that's what you do for your child, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So being mindful of that, like, hey, that kind mm-hmm. of weird feeling that you get in your gut every mm-hmm. once in a while, mm-hmm. you need to look at that. It's okay for you to grieve. It's okay to say, I wish that my son was graduating from high school. Mm-hmm. I wish that I knew what his future looked like. Right. It's okay for me to sit with that feeling at night and even let my allow myself to cry. Right. Permission to feel. Yeah. You know, like just things that people don't think about. Like I know parents think about when they're going to pass on and what's going to mm-hmm. happen to their children. I understand that. There are many parents that feel that way. For me, mm-hmm. I feel like I haven't I haven't allowed myself to grieve the fact that if I pass on, what happens to Isaiah? Mm-hmm. And will he get that support and the the things that he needs? 
right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so instead, I just have this fear and the stress, and I just like go through that, but I don't ask for help. I have a mentor. Let's talk about that, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? And so I think being mindful is something that's really helped me. Right. Pausing and checking in with yourself. Like, hey, what is this experience that I'm having right now? Yeah. What are these thoughts? What are these feelings? Like taking a step back, right? Exactly. And then I'm going, okay, so what is it that I'm feeling? So if I'm experiencing these things, what am I feeling? And how are these connected? What yep. do I need right now? What will help me in this moment, right? Yep. And do you feel like the more you were able to connect with that mindful presence and that checking in with yourself? allowed you to stay more present with your feelings and then be able to be more focused on Isaiah? Did you see? Yes. Did you see that trend appear for you? Yeah. Yes, for sure. Yeah. And actually enjoy Isaiah as my child and not mm-hmm. just a child living with autism. And I feel mm-hmm. like that is mm-hmm. the defining moment where I'm now looking at Isaiah as this is my son. Right. Instead of always being out in the world, this is my son with autism. No label, no attachment of exactly. having to give him a, a label of exceptionality yep. in any way. It's just, this is yep. my son for everything yep. that he is. Yep. Right. So tell me, how has your untold story affected your mental health? This journey of being a parent, raising a child with an exceptionality. I know we started to talk about different parts of you know, grief and mourning and how that wasn't present and some of the turmoil that came from that. Can you also speak to some of those emotions that came up for you? Like you talked a little bit about guilt. Were there other emotions that you felt or other things that took a toll in your mind or did it manifest in any way? Anything uh, in that realm that you'd be able to share? Yes, I became very stressed and Mm -hmm overly concerned about what people think Mm. which in turn created more stress (laughs) it did chip away at some of the happiness infuser that I am apart from my show like I I feel like a lot of the energy was given to the show but not in life right and I think a lot of that had to do with when I get home I'm trying to continue to find answers, trying to continue to find that one thing that's going to catapult Isaiah's cognitive abilities. And it was really chipping away at how I felt about myself Mm -hmm. because of that guilt, because of that, in a sense, shame. And not shame of him, of shame of not, in my mind, being the best parent for him comparing his journey to another child with autism's journey, right? So, and so you were questioning yourself, you know, what am I doing right or wrong or yeah, what am I missing? That kind of stuff. Yeah. And and if I can ask, so you have two children. Your daughter, is she older than Isaiah? Yes. Okay. So, were you able to remind yourself that, you know, you did have the ability to have two children that showed up in the world differently? I feel like I'm hearing sometimes that it's easy to blame yourself, right? Yeah. Were you able to remind yourself at all that this isn't something I can blame myself for? You know, I've got two kids who are doing it differently and one might be more mainstream than the other, but were you able to draw from that insight at all during some of the tumult part of the journey? I wish I could say yes, but no, I think I went into overcompensating for Mm. my other child. Because there was a lot of time and dedication to Isaiah um, learning more about his world. And then I'm like, okay, well, then I need to even do even more for my daughter because right. now she's going to feel left out. And there's a lot of time with Isaiah. So so then there was a guilt of that. I don't have enough time to help Destiny. And now well, there's Isaiah too. They both need mm-hmm. me. And I felt like I was pulled in, in both directions. Although Destiny was a beautiful child and and really learned a lot about how to work with her brother and to the point where, because she was younger, because they're three years apart, and at first she didn't understand the attention, the therapist coming in and and all the Mm -hmm. hours of care and and learning Mm -hmm. that was involved after the diagnosis, and she didn't get it. But CPRI and the Thames Valley Children's Center they have such incredible resources for families 
that they literally saved this family with those resources. And so one of the supports that they gave siblings, so they would have a day every few months that was just for them. They would have support groups for them where they were able to do activities and hang out with other children who had siblings with autism. And so I remember after the first workshop, Destiny changed. She was very upset about Isaiah at first. Well, like, why is it always about him? And, you know, why does he get all the attention to the point where her friends would come over and she's in high school and she would simply say, hey, my brother has autism. He may walk out of his room just in his underwear. You're just going to have to get used to it. It would just be a funny thing, but it was just normal to her. Like, I don't have to explain this. Right. And so I actually learned a little bit more about understanding how to not have to prove anything to people from both of my children, for my daughter saying, hey, this is what it is. Welcome to my home. Right. Right. (laughs) Deal with it. Amazing. Okay. So, Saidat, what is your key message to the listeners of our show? What do you want them to know? That it's okay to be happy, sad, angry, frustrated, feel regret, grieve, have all the feels. Mm. Know that you can ask for help. Be vulnerable Mm -hmm. with the people you trust, of course, and then come right back and be that strong person for the the person in your life who needs you the most. Yeah, there's a cycle there, right? So if you take care of yourself and allow yourself to have your feelings and your emotions and allow yourself to reach out and get help, then you can be that strong, solid foundation for your child or whoever your loved one is. That's right. Okay. So I'm curious, your game-changing inspiration, that piece that really reflects your untold story. Like, I know sometimes people tell me about a quote or a book or a person or event or something that really speaks volumes for you. The pivotal moment in my parenthood came when my son looked at me in the middle of a meltdown in the middle of the Mm -hmm. store where people are looking at us and in my mind they're judging me they're making Mm -hmm. comments and I'm getting Mm -hmm. upset as I'm trying to take care of my son who is about six foot at that time and Mm -hmm. I'm looking upset and I'm looking at the people looking at me like what are you doing why Mm -hmm. are you looking at me and I'm, I'm ready to just go out on a rage. And I look into my son's eyes and I realize he doesn't care what they think. Mm-hmm. He's upset and he's going to have that meltdown right in the middle of the store. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. And when he's done, he's not going to feel judged. Mm-hmm. He's not going to feel any remorse. He's just going to mm-hmm. walk out of that store like nothing ever happened. Right. <laughs> He's going to have his feelings and process them and then move on. It was so liberating. I'm just like, why right. do I care what they think right. when he right. does not care? Right. right. Like, exactly. <laughs> like, if he's not bothered about what other people think, why should I? Right? Yeah. And so for me, it was kind of like, this is all about you, Sidet. You're mm, acting as if it's about Isaiah, but really it's about your feelings. It's about how yeah. you feel about this. He doesn't care. Yeah. And you no know, acceptance. oh my goodness, it, it, it's liberating when you have to walk in. I'm like, I'm with my son, whatever. <laughs> You'll figure it mm-hmm. out. If you don't, right. there's Google. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. And all you had to do was be present for yourself and your exactly. son. Exactly. <laughs> and it, it didn't really matter if someone saw something or didn't see something and that's it. Yeah. Okay. So tell me, what is a cause or organization that's been really impactful to you on your journey that you'd like to give a shout out to? Who would that be? Yes, I would like to give a big shout out to Tim's Valley District School Board for having such incredible EAs that not only care for the academic side of teaching children with exceptionalities, but the emotional support that they not only give their children, but the parents as well. So for all those incredible EAs, thank you. And also Mm. to Tim's Valley Children's Center, you were our rock when I had no idea the journey that I was about to embark on. 
And with all the resources and encouragement and consistency, it helped us be able to know how to support Isaiah and what to do to help him thrive in his world. So thank you so much. And Lynn, our incredible PSW who works with Isaiah for the past 10 years, you are awesome. And to every friend, every community leader that has mm -hmm. helped us help Isaiah feel that he's part of the community, I thank you. From my friend Bridget to all of my friends who Isaiah loves and you know who you are, Justin, mm -hmm. Daniel, everyone. And to my incredible, incredible fiance, who has always been Isaiah's support, you, you make this world complete. You make me complete. That's so beautiful. What a lovely, complete shout out. That's so amazing. Okay, so Saidat, what platforms are you findable on? So if people want to connect with you, uh, where do they find you? Yes. So I'm on every platform, I think, but mainly on Instagram, the Sidet show mm -hmm. on Twitter, also mm -hmm. on Facebook, on Spotify and on YouTube. All right. Well, we will have all of your handles and all of the ways to connect with you on the show notes page. So the listeners are welcome to check that out on the page and uh, they'll be able to connect with you because I'm sure there's many people who are going to want to reach out to you for sure. Yes. All right. Well, guess what, Saidat? What? You, my dear, have just dared yourself to share. Congratulations. Aww, thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much. This was a part of my healing as well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. That's so good. That's so great to hear. And you know, Saidat, I just want to convey how important it was to have your story told and, and heard and shared the story of taking time to connect with difficult and painful emotions, exuding happiness and connecting with grief. Despite this need to keep pushing forward, you, you did find a way to pause and become mindful and connect with yourself. And this whole life lesson of not caring so much about what other people think and focusing on what's important for you and finding your way to your truth of acceptance of life. This has been truly inspiring and encouraging. And, and so I'm just grateful to have witnessed this part of your journey and, and been there for that, to hear it. Thank so you. thank you for the deep conversation and for all the daring and sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Once again, Saidat, thank you for being part of Dare to Share Your Untold Story and helping to be a voice in breaking down the barriers of mental stigma. To all of our listeners, if you like what you've been hearing on this podcast and you want to be part of breaking down barriers of mental stigma, I invite you to go wherever you are listening to the episode and hit subscribe. Leave us a comment or a review of the episode and maybe how you relate to it. To learn more about what we offer, visit www.daretoheal.co. And if you are feeling ready and brave to share, please submit your story by visiting www.daretoshare.co. Thanks for joining in.